Welcome to Thursday Night Angry Marks.com Pro Wrestling and Mixed Martial Arts Podcast. My name is Stevie J. Two people on the line with me, as always, for this fine program, starting with Jason Harland, a.k.a. The Great Sudoku. I'd just like to take this time to say happy birthday, Hiroyoshi Tenzan. Yes, indeed. And we celebrate all things Ten Cozy on Thursday Night AMP, because just like Cozy underscore Lariat, the man who eats five of bread a day is a member of a bread club, and so is the woman who eats five of bread a day, our very own Abby. I don't eat five of bread a day, but, you know, I'll say I do, just so, you know, I don't disappoint Cozy. <laughs> Absolutely. Who wants to disappoint Cozy underscore Lariat? We all want to be members of his bread club. Of course. Speaking of disappointing... The finale of the New Japan Cup. As Jason and I were saying off the air before you joined us, it started out good and then slid backwards. The 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 match itself, the the final match between Folly and Shibata, or the whole tournament? The tournament itself slid backwards, but the final match was okay. <laughs> Just the cards seemed to get progressively less interesting the further we went. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I don't know. I've, I've heard people gripe and complain about the house shows and how the same thing over and over but at least they had fun matches on the cards for the most part um what gato is booking i'm i'm not real sure because i don't see shibata being somebody to knock okada off right now i just i, I don't I, 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 don't I think they're either. wasting it i don't know i was i've been trying to figure out what he's doing and i think it's just a wasted opportunity because i think everybody within their right mind knows that Omega is going to be the champion before they come here in July. So I don't know what they're doing with Shibata unless they're going to make him a interim champion or they're going to have him lose to Okada or I just, I don't know. I just don't know. It just they doesn't just make a lot of sense. They had such a great first round match between Kenny Omega and Tomohiro Ishii and then just nothing else throughout the whole tournament was able to live up to that. It's like I had high hopes for the final match, but when it boils down to it, it's Shibata and Bad Luck Ballet, and you just can't get blood from a stone sometimes. I mean, there were, the tournament itself had some good matches. Evil and Tanahashi was good. Um, that was Ishii another first match, was wasn't it? Amazing, uh huh. Um, Shibata and Suzuki was good. It was. It didn't live up to my expectations yeah, because it was you know, okay. because both guys lived, but. <laughs> The ring was yeah, still standing like after her. Yeah, but, you know, and then you went on and on, and it's like the next really good match was Shibata and Ishii in the semifinals because those two, you know, they just can't have a bad match. But, yeah, Fale and, and Shibata, I wasn't real sure about that. It kind of ended up being, you know, it is what it is. You know, like I said, I had higher hopes for it, but when it boils down to it, it's like, yeah, what, what are you going to do with bad luck Fale in a main event? The it's only- like, Ballet can have good matches, but he needs a guy that can carry him, and Shibata just doesn't work that style. Shibata's just going to kick his ass. The only reason I could have even seen Fale being in the finals of it would be if the winner was going to go on to challenge for the Intercontinental title, and then it would have made sense for Fale to be in it and win. Or the Never Open title or something, but yeah, not the, not the, not the main heavyweight title, anyway. I was well, we expecting see- Shibata to win and challenge for the IC title. I wasn't expecting this to be directed towards Okada. No, that, that like you said before about Omega being the champion when they come to America for shows, that's really the logical continuity point of booking. If you're booking backwards from what's going to be the biggest when they come to the Americas, that's what makes sense. Yeah, and plus they've held off on having Shibata and Okada touch each other for all these years, and this will be doing it with, I mean, the match is in two weeks. It's going to be a throwaway, yeah. Yeah, and it's going to be like you're you're throwing this away, in a way, and I could just I could see it being better to have a build up where the winner of the New Japan Cup challenged for the Intercontinental Title, they beat Naito, Naito goes on to the G1, Naito goes on to win the G1 to headline Wrestle Kingdom. Now you mentioned it being in two weeks, and that leads to a question I've been meaning to ask both of you: Sakura Genesis. I don't think I watched that last year. Is that considered to be a big four type of pay per view, or is that just another one of their regular shows that's not a really big one like Dominion or the Tokyo Dome on January fourth? 
sacrogenesis didn't happen last year. It was invasion attack last uh, year. That would explain why I don't remember there being one last yeah. year. So you just answered my question. Thank you. <laughs> They've changed the name. Um, Genesis, it's, it's one of – New Japan really has 12 big shows a year, one every month. Um, but there but are a big few shows. that are big, big shows, like the Tokyo Dome and, and Dominion. Yeah, um, and Dominion, and Dominion, G1 – and the Tokyo Dome show are the big three for them for the year. Toss in best of the super juniors and the tag leagues and things like that. But no, I mean, it's, it's their big, um, April show. Okay. And then Don Taku will be May. Um, June is Dominion. Then July we hit the G1. So I guess we can't consider Sakura Genesis a major show. So if they do a throwaway. No, but the- Sorry, if they do a throwaway world title match that doesn't mean anything and Okada retains, then it doesn't matter. Yeah, but it does because you're putting Shibata out there and having him lose. You know, and it's like, you you, you did all this and you didn't really build up to it. And I don't know, it just feels like they've kept them apart for so long to put them together now in this situation is kind of like, and like you're saying, okay. too, they're kind of in a damned if you do, damned if you don't spot with Shibata now. Yeah. Because either either he's going to lose to Okada and it's like, okay, he won that tournament and that's pointless, or he's going to win the title and hold on to it for a month. a month and then lose it to Omega. Yeah, they have kind of painted themselves into a corner with this one. It it really would have been better if Fale had won because Fale could take the loss and nobody would care. Yeah, and plus Fale and Okada have had some actually really good matches in the past. Mm. Yeah, like, well, I said, when Paul is in there with somebody who can carry him and works a style that isn't let me kick your head off, it works with a guy like Okada. But yeah, with a guy like Shibata, it just, it just didn't work. Well, with that being said, any other highlights from the New Japan Cup from the final two days of the tournament that you guys want to talk about? Tai Chi got hit with his own microphone stand. <laughs> yeah, that was good. I, I popped for that. That was about the only thing I popped for from those two shows was Gato getting Tai Chi's microphone stand and wailing on him with it. That's always nice to see um, Tai Chi get beat the hell out of. Yeah, I'll take it any way I can get it. Other than that, though, not much. Yeah, um, that uh, like I said in the review. It's aura a just freaking me out. Juiced up kid there. Oh, good lord. Honestly, Juiced up and tanned, tanned like Honda. Even though these shows started at a not ungodly hour in the morning, I just had such a hard time keeping my interest up watching them. It just, it just, they, there just didn't seem to be any energy to it. Even the fans in the crowd just didn't seem to be into it. But I think that one night really killed me with just the static camera and no commentators. That was the one that was like, oh my god. That's kind of rough, yeah. Yeah, I mean, unless you're really into the shows and into the people on them, sometimes it's hard to sit through them. And I think once these shows are hitting, like the Taguchi Japan versus Los Ingo Bernables matches, then it's like, okay, we're like three matches left. Now it's going to get good. Right. But you're right. And I always do pop when Los Ingo Bernables come out. That's like the one thing I'm always waiting for in every card now is like, when are my boys at LIJ going to show up and start wrecking the joint? Uh-huh. Well, they call it and the New that- Japan, but it's it's really New Japan's ragtag crew of guys they throw together that aren't in a stable, like Taguchi and Juice and Elgin and Tanahashi, and just guys with nowhere else to go, basically. <laughs> it's it's Taguchi Japan. Japan. That's what they call it. <laughs> I, I agree Give Taguchi... Give him a bone, okay? The man's got so little to deal with except those skin masks I, you know? I, I don't want to give anybody a bone who uses his ass as a weapon <laughs> oh. well you know Oscar uses her ass as a weapon you want to give her a bone <laughs> I plead the fifth on that one yeah I refuse to answer the that's what might, I thought might be so. Incriminating. <laughs> so give Taguchi a bone and just let him have his little group for a little bit oh uh, well that's fine better than him being in singles better, competition for a world title. I'll take it. It's better that than him having, you know, coming to the ring singing well, yeah. in a green sequin jacket. I, I certainly can't argue with anything you just said. Uh-huh. Well, if he's got Big Bird on his head, then he can sing all he wants. If he, if he comes to us like King Tut, he can sing all he wants. 
or Taguchi. But yeah, joining 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 Taguchi Japan at Sakura Genesis will be Ricochet. It will be good to see him back in New Japan. Yeah, Ricochet was kind of surprised he was going to be part of um, Taguchi Japan. He put on, he responded to somebody on Twitter when they said that Taguchi had um, inducted him into the group. Huh? What? What the hell are you talking about? Yeah, you're in there with him. Oh, okay. The Genesis show looks really good on paper. Let's just hope they can pull it off. It yeah. does. The two shows before that don't, and I'm I'm going to skip watching those live. I might watch them later in the day, but they just look so lackluster on paper. The show this Sunday and then the show on the 4th, it's just kind of like, eh. Those I'm going to skip, but yeah, Genesis has some promise to it. Since I've got the card pulled up in front of me, and since none of us are that thrilled about talking about the cup, why don't we just go over it, because I've got it right here with the pre-show match, starting with Finlay, Liger, and Nakanishi versus Kawato, Kitamura, and Oka. David, the old young just, lion, the... Yeah. The old young lion, the Liger, and Mr. Guyliner. Just, David, please, cut, cut that Guyliner stuff out. It's just not working for you. <laughs> Poor David, he needs some some fashion advice. Jay Jay White needs to go back over there and help him out for a little bit. I don't know, were, David. Were you complaining Finley's about Jay White's win. haircut at the ROH show? Jay White's hair is bad, but at least he's not walking around in guy liner. <laughs> and leopard panties of varying colors. Yeah. <laughs> well, moving on from that, we have Hangman Page, Tamatanga, Tangaloa, and Yujiro Takahashi versus Tiger Mask, Tiger Mask, Makabe, and Nagata. Really? See, he I would is... almost say that the Tiger Mask W team would win, and I'm uh, still trying to figure out why Tiger Mask W is in an undercard match, multi-man tag. I don't know. Who's on the Bullet Club team? Uh, the Bullet Club was Paige, Tonga, Loa, and Takahashi. Uh, I'm looking at, I must be looking at the wrong site because it's saying Chase Owens is in there, so I must have outdated info on my site here. Well, I don't think it matters which one of the two of them it is. It's probably the same <laughs> outcome. Yeah, Bullet Club D team will win. <laughs> yeah. And then we've got Beretta, Rocky Romero, and Yoshihashi versus Suzuki Goon, El Desperado, Minoru Suzuki, and Taga Mishinoku. So please, Suzuki Goon win. Even though I like Beretta and Romero, please, Suzuki Goon win. This would be a good match. This one I'm looking forward to. I feel so bad for me, Sue. He's just kind of there now. He's that's, just that's like, again, they don't know what to do with him. him. Yeah, I mean, I'm pulling for him just to get wins now, just to get back some relevance, because I don't want him to always be doing the jobs. When's the last time he had a singles match? Okada? Yeah, probably. And yeah, it, it's just disparaging to see him in these multi-man tag, tag matches, because his talent level is so far above that. Yeah, that's the only singles match he's had since he's been back is with Okada. It just seemed, he just seems so wasted in tag matches and mixed tag matches and multi-tag matches and what have you. Yeah, it's hard it's to just watch a guy just, have a world title match for 50 minutes and then do multi-man tags after that. It just that's one more thing that I'm trying to figure out what, you know, Gato is doing booking-wise. The exact other opposite than, of know, what they did with Suzuki Goon and Noah, apparently. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like that. The, the parallels sometimes between WWE and New Japan are just odd. That's like you have the parallels now between Reigns and Okada. It's like let's push them to the exclusion of everybody else. Well, I, I can only draw the parallels so far because I don't see Okada getting booed out of the building at any of their shows the way Reigns does. I'm talking booking-wise, not fan reaction. <laughs> Definitely not, because Okada is still well-loved and admired. Yeah, New Japan never not has to like, mute mics for Okada. <laughs> They don't have to edit out the crowd chants for Okada. So next Although it's interesting, Okada's kind of like Naito, where some places he'll get cheered and other places he won't. But he never gets, like, outright hate. No, he never gets booed out of the building. Except by Send Andy. me over there, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll take Shinsuke Girl's place and scream louder than anybody. <laughs> well, who do you want to boo in the next match, then? We've got Taichi and Kanemaru versus Jado and Ghetto. Who do you like the least in that? Tai Chi. Tai Chi. <laughs> <laughs> That's a no-brainer. Like, I don't know. You've kind of seemed to have something out for for both Jado and Gato lately, so I wasn't sure. I just think I don't think it's ever really a good idea when the bookers want a title, or have a title, or get a title, or in the title picture. Yeah, like Jeff Jarrett and Impact Wrestling. I know what you're meaning. I know what you're saying. And plus, they're 800 years old. It's time. It's time to. 
build up new teams. Old guys in a junior tag team title match. So that, yeah, it's kind of there. I have no problem with the bookers putting themselves in a title match as long as they're not going over. As long as they can put on a good match, I have no problem with that. But yeah, if they're if they're there to take the titles, I mean, granted, it is Tai Chi and Kanemaru. I really don't give a shit about them losing the titles. So. That's what I was about to say. How is it really worse if Jado would get a hold of the titles? Because we don't want Tai Chi holding a title. We don't want Tai Chi holding anything <laughs> anywhere where we can see it. <laughs> but at least he at least he got rid of uh, what do you call him, Peter Rabbit. Or as I call it, the Donnie Darkest stripper. He had a better, he had a better floozy at the last New Japan show. Tai Chi's not. No, that's, that's Peter not who is I'm thinking Peter's of. That's Bullet Club. Thinking of. I'm thinking of Ujira. I'm getting, I'm getting sleazes mixed Miho up. Miho is with Tai Chi. Right. You're, that's you're, who it is. You're mixing up sleaziness there. Yes, I am. It's been, yeah, that's what happens at Stupid O'Clock. <laughs> that's quite all right. Well, speaking of Stupid O'Clock, our uh, semi-finalist from the New Japan Cup is in the next match, Bad Luck Fale, teaming with Kenny Omega against Ishii and Yano. That'll just be fun. Should be. Yano will, you know, tape somebody to a guardrail. Turnbuckle pad is coming off. Yeah. Low blow roll up. I kind of feel bad for Omega, too. He's just kind of sitting there twiddling his thumbs and waiting until, you know, the next title opportunity rolls around, which he's even said himself this past week. And I, I yeah, I have to agree with him. It's like, I'm getting sick of these house shows too. And you, like we said, you've got guys like Kenny Omega, you've got guys like Minoru Suzuki who are sitting around just mired in tag team matches and multi-man tag matches. And you've got, you know, arguably two guys who can put on wonderful singles main events and you're not doing it. Okay. Now I read Omega's statement and I read it two different ways. I read one way as being a legitimate, yeah, this is a waste of my time and my talents. And the other way I read it was, I'm just playing up the heel persona because I'm not really supposed to be a baby face. I think it was more of the latter than the former because Omega is, he, he's a really great actor when it comes to wrestling, but he's also somebody that loves the business and has said, I hate serious matches. I can't stand serious matches. I want to go out there and have fun and make people laugh, you know. So I think he enjoys them, but by that same token, you can sense his frustration. Like I came off the best match arguably ever and you know now i'm wrestling yana <laughs> what the fuck now i've got to team up with bad luck Fale to take on yana yeah Nisha. i yeah, should have like... said that other than now i'm wrestling yana because yana was perfect but i know yana was your spirit <laughs> animal i couldn't believe you were dogging yana. <laughs> okay let me backtrack omega has had like the best match ever and now he's teaming with Fale. you know <laughs> that's a better way of putting it yes yeah, I'm still pissed that Fale is, you know, got me blocked on Twitter, so. <laughs> well, maybe if you send him a little over, hat, he'll unblock you. I know. I think he blocked me because he thought I was insulting the hat. I liked the hat. The tiny little G1 hat that was too small for his head. <laughs> well, in this defense, it, it probably is hard to find a hat that fits that giant noggin. This is true. He is not a small man anywhere. He's just a <laughs> huge hulking dude. You, you say small man anywhere. I wonder how much you know that we don't know. <laughs> that did not come out right. Yeah. So we'll just move on from that, and we'll go to Los Ingobernables, Bushi Evil, Sonata, and Naito, versus the aforementioned Taguchi, Japan, the stable of guys that are together just for the fuck of it. Tanahashi, Juice, Ricochet, and Taguchi. I don't know. I'm I say... Ricochet. I say Taguchi, Japan wins. Because poor Los Ingo Bernables ain't got nothing happening with them these days. Yeah, unfortunately, they do kind of seem to be stuck in mid card except, except for Hiromu. I don't know. I don't know if Naito is supposed to be feuding with Elgin over the title, or if they're just not doing anything with the Intercontinental title right now. Uh, which Naito's is something that they really with could it on be the way doing. To the ring. Well, he's yeah, per- he's perfecting his IC title toss. But it'll be good to see Ricochet back in the ring. We haven't seen Ricochet in New Japan in, in a while. It'll be good to see him back there. And Tanahashi will probably have some weave and some braids going, so that'll be good to see, too. Just By the way, I've trademarked the Tana weave, so anybody uses it, you owe me royalties, okay? We'll get to the whole trademark deal later. I, I trademarked bald Tana, then. Yeah, just... No, you cannot have bald Tana. <laughs> he got his All weave. All Tana are mine. <laughs> Okay, but I just want to clarify something because I now that Lucha Underground is on Netflix, 
how does that affect his contractual standing with appearing for other people? Because I believe the Lucha Underground contract said you can't appear on other people's TV while you're on our TV. So I don't know if that counts as their TV or not. Who? Lucha Underground's. I I think Lucha Underground did not foresee any of this coming and tried to, you know, have contingency plans in place to cover their bases with seven-year contracts and weird language in them. I don't think they could enforce a show not being on someone else's show when their show's in basically syndication because that's what Netflix is now. Streaming services are today syndication. That's exactly why I was wondering if it applied. It's but, also not the same character, too. Well, it is, but it isn't, because they, they're having the exact same problem with the Lucha Underground guys from AAA who are trying to get booked elsewhere, and it's like, well, you're using a different name, but you're still the same guy, so we're still going to block you. Well, a lot of that shit is coming from AAA's end, is it not? True. That's the dumpster fire that is AAA these days. Uh, it, well, no, you know it's that's bad. That's kind of AAA being dicks. I mean, that's not like Lucha Underground is telling Ricochet, you know, you cannot appear on, on New Japan. They're not telling Ricochet that. They're not saying, you know, you, you're, you have to go as Prince Puma and represent Lucha Underground, or you can't go at all. Things like that. They're, they're giving him leeway to do what he needs to do. Well, I was about to say, you know it's bad when even X-Pac is telling people that AAA is going to fuck Impact because that's what they do. They fuck people. Fuck that owl. <laughs> He's saying the owl is getting fucked. <laughs> Good. Fuck that owl. <laughs> that's that's the one case where it is okay for AAA to fuck somebody. Go ahead and fuck fuck Impact Wrestling because fuck that owl. Everybody else you're fucking, the wrestlers you're fucking, no, don't. Like Phoenix, like Ray Phoenix or whatever the hell he wants to call himself, and Pentagon Junior or Penna Zero so M or whatever or name they're, M, yeah. they're trying to trademark. Yeah, just just. Just stop all that bullshit, AAA, but you want to fuck Impact Wrestling, go ahead and fuck that owl. Well, as previously noted, we're going to talk more about trademarks later, but let's just go ahead with the rest of this card, because <laughs> next up, we have everybody's favorite five of bread a day. That would be our very own Cozy underscore Lariat, and his And the team, birthday boy. And the birthday boy, and they're taking on War Machine. That should be fantastic. And it's a title match for the IWGP Heavyweight Tag Titles. Yes, the titles that actually Yes, the matter. titles that we forgot existed. The titles we forgot because, yeah, because New Japan booking is just shit right now. That's one and thing that I kind of wish they would be more consistent with is <clears throat> be more consistent with your champions and let them have singles matches every once in a while that aren't championship matches. One of my points of contention with the whole New Japan Cup is, okay, you want to have tag matches and multi-man tag matches, why not have one or both of the IWGP tag titles defended, you know, in the semifinal show or the final show, or even have the never six-man titles defended, but they didn't. It was just, that was what made it so monotonous, is it was multi-man tag, multi-man tag, multi-man tag, multi-man tag, multi-man tag, main event. And nothing, nothing before the New Japan Cup matches had any... Significance to them. Well, even, I mean, sometimes it's not a matter of it having so much significance. It's we never get to see the junior heavyweight champion in a singles match unless it's a title match. Or the uh, best of the super juniors. Yeah, we never get to see the, I mean, it's not like, and I hate to bring WWE up again, but, you know, it's not like with the U.S. champion or the intercontinental champion in WWE, we get to see them in singles action every week. You know, it's not like they're in multi-man matches or tag matches leading up to a pay-per-view. Of course, that's because Vince is stupid, but, you know, there, there's got to be a happy medium somewhere between too many singles matches and the title being online all the time to never being on the line and, the yeah, multi-man tag all the time. And one thing I've noticed they've done lately in New Japan is they, with singles matches, is sometimes they'll let the Young Lions have singles matches. I'd rather see the Young Lions in multi-man tag action and let some of the veterans have singles matches. Well, the Young Lions, they, they all, they've always had singles matches on the card, or at least to open it up. Remember all the show and Yohi matches we used to get and all the David and Jay yeah. matches we used to get? <laughs> For Jay beat David like, 47,000 shows in a row. Consecutively, Where we yeah. were begging for yeah. Finley to not be the one looking up at the lights. Yeah, please let David win a match someday. <laughs> Before the leopard panty and the guy liner. 
I mean, I would love to see War Machine win, but there's some kind of weird rumors floating around in the air of contract situations and all the other crap that's going on this week. So I don't know if War Machine would win or not. Yes, that's even more news we have to address after we get through the rest of Sakura Genesis, but we still have three. Yeah, we got a long list of stuff. (laughs) Yeah, so let's get through these last three matches on this card. Hiroki Goto and Zack Sabre Jr. with Hiroki defending the Never Open Weight. I want to see him die. Ah. I do too. Kill him, Zack. Well, Zack's got enough aerial (laughs) offense in his arsenal to make that happen. See, that's something, because Zabby usually likes to see the, the British guys get beat, but I guess her hate for Gato kind of outweighs her hate for the British guys in New Japan. My indifference for Gato just basically... <laughs> I, there, I just cannot get into this guy. He is still just there. And I don't know what it is. It's just he's somebody that I just cannot connect with on any level. So I say, yes, let, you know... Let Zack Sabre Jr. just kill him. Let Suzuki Goon come out there and beat the shit out of him. <laughs> I don't care. Send him back to that waterfall. Let him find a personality that maybe got <laughs> washed off. And come back and do something different. Well, that's one thing we can't say about Zack Sabre. You can't say he doesn't have a personality. He's got that in spades. Yes, he does. Not that he'll get to, you know, express that much of it in New Japan. But, yeah, he's got it. Will he have some darker color ring gear on now that he's part of Suzuki Goon? That remains to be seen. No. Probably not. He needs to wear white to stand out, you know, well, and, you know, <laughs> rep suplex. I was about to say, speaking of standing out, Hiromu Takahashi, that guy stands out in the crowd. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> He'll to be taking on Kushida with the junior heavyweight championship on the line. Yeah. Number one, do not put the belt back on Kushida because it's obvious they don't know what to do with Kushida when he's the champion. Yeah, because the way I'm feeling about Kushida is kind of the way I feel about Okada. Granted, Kushida's not champion, but the parallels there are just uncanny. It's just like we've seen enough of Kushida holding the belt. We've seen enough of Kushida challenging for the belt. Get somebody new. It's nice to see somebody new in Hiromo with the title, but get some new challengers, please. Ricochet's back. Let's see Ricochet take on Hiromo. And for the love of God, oh, we don't God. need all of Los Ingobernables to be failing at everything right now. We need one guy in the stable to actually be doing well and successful and holding a belt. Yeah, and I don't expect, you know, Hiromo's match with Kushida to be as crazy as the one with Dragon Lee was. I don't expect it to be as good as the one with Taguchi was. I expect it to be somewhere in the middle. Well, the one with Taguchi was unexpectedly good because I tend to expect nothing from Taguchi. The thing is, we forget how good of a wrestler Taguchi is because of, you know, Big Bird on my head playing a recorder, hitting everybody with his ass all the time. (laughs) But he's really, really good. Yeah, once in a while, he actually reminds us of that. Yeah, like the best of the Super Juniors last year, it was you saw how good he was and that turned so many people around on him like, Damn, where have you been for the last two years? <laughs> we want you to win. Beat this dumbass Willie Osprey. Just kick his ass. But alas, that didn't There's happen. There's another Osprey versus Hiromu would be another good match for the junior tag title or the junior heavyweight singles title. Yes, and I would want Hiromu to kill him. And our main event, Kazuka Okada and Katsuyori Shibata. I just can't see Shibata winning this match. I just, I can't. There hasn't been enough field. There hadn't been enough field. There, I don't know. There's just, there's, there's some facet of this match missing. It's that Shibata, it just, it doesn't seem like a quest that he's been on. We've, we've never gotten that visual look at him like, this is my path, I'm building my way up to this, and now I'm going to achieve this. It doesn't. There doesn't seem to be a story being told here. And that's the yeah, problem. Gotta... They, they could have built that up. Instead of having him win this tournament, they could have had this, you know, play out after the tournament, or they could have this play out after Omega allegedly wins the title. You could have a nice build-up, a nice story going on, you know, over the course of a month, or two months, or three months, but no, it's just rushed. It's there's just nothing there. I mean, New Japan is not all about the angles and the storylines, but when it comes to the IWGP title, there's normally more depth to it than, hey, I won a tournament, so I'm going after the title. Right. Unless it's just- the G1 tournament, because then you've got, you know, from the summertime until January to kind of stew over, ooh, this guy won the G1, he's going to take on the champion at, at Wrestle Kingdom. 
you know, with the New Japan Cup, you've got like three weeks in between. So it's like, eh. yeah. Unless they do something on the road shows that make it a little bit more interesting and add a little bit more question to it, I just see this being another Okada match where he wins with the Rainmaker. Rainmaker! Ugh. <laughs> Oh, well, we can move on to happier subjects then, like the ongoing trademark war between the Hardys and Impact Wrestling. Yay, happy, fun time. <laughs> Lord have mercy. You were the one who clued Lord us all into this, Abby, because you said, did you notice anything about these videos? And then showed us a screen cap of the trademark in all the headlines. Yeah, I was, I was scrolling through Twitter last night and saw something with... Um, Rebby Hardy pop up. Uh, have you seen this? They're, you know, they're, they put a TM after every broken mat on the YouTube channel. I went there and was like, Oh my God, you idiots. How stupid can you be? Doing this does nothing except piss everybody off, which it did because she went on another scorched earth tirade, which was highly entertaining. <laughs> but it's like, you go, you don't go out there and add a little TM that is not yours to add after the fact. You know, and it's like, shit, if we can just start going and slapping trademarks on things that we want to lay claim to, I got some post-it notes that I can start filling out. <laughs> As Rebby said in her Twitter rant, not only does this give us more ammunition when this gets under jurisdiction and we review it in front of a court, it also just makes you look petty and vindictive and burn the earth more than you've already done, and why would anybody want to work for you after that? And on top yes. of everything else... It doesn't hurt Matt in the least because he's still going to go on and do shows and make a lot of money. So if you're trying to screw with him, you failed. That was the part that hit me. It's like, you know, who is going to want to work for Impact Wrestling? You know, wrestlers that are not currently under contract with Impact. I mean, even if Impact is throwing a lot of money at them, you know, what is going to make a wrestler want to work for a company that dicks over talent like this? That takes this kind of anti-talent stance. Yeah, and a company that wants, you know, 10, is it 10% of your outside bookings or 15%? It's at least 10. It's probably more. Yeah, you know, and it's like, why? You didn't do anything to get my, me my bookings. You're not doing anything for me. I don't know. It just looks, it looks so ridiculous for Anthem and Impact to be doing this when everybody and their brother knows that this was Matt Hardy funding this, creating this, paying for it, and all of that last year when TNA was, you know, all that infighting with Billy Corgan. And let's just put a bottom line on it. There's no way any of the creative people at Impact could have come up with any of those ideas. It was all his vision. He was the one who put it all together from his own broken, demented mind. Nobody else came up with it. He did. No, and especially when it comes out, okay, well, half of the people weren't even signed to a contract. Right. As um, Ruby pointed out, how can you trademark Senior Benjamin or Maxel? You can't. Yeah, and the fact that Hardy was paying for it, you know, they were footing the bill for this. They were underwriting all of the broken hearty deletion stuff not dixie not tna but them i mean i don't see how they have any claims to that idea that gimmick anything having to do with it when they weren't even footing the bill for it i mean unless it expressly says in the hardy's contracts that anything they come up with creatively is the property of i guess then tna now impact wrestling you know barring that they have no leg to stand on and I think if yeah, it goes to court, it, we're going to find out they don't have that leg to stand on. Yeah, speaking of court, it came out this week that um, Eric Bischoff is looking for a summary judgment against TNA for whatever money he's suing for, for breach of contract. $114,500 and two cents. Where did the two cents I come don't from? Know, that's what I want to know. That's what cracks me up about it is the two cents at the end. Two cents, yes. <laughs> I want to put your two cents in. He put his two cents in. That's where it comes from. <laughs> that could be what it is. But yes, it turns out that the Anthem deal with TNA was an asset-only purchase, meaning that Anthem purchased the positives 
quote unquote, from Impact and TNA, not the negatives. So Dixie Carter is left holding the bag when it comes to all of Impact's previous debts and litigation. And on top of that, they're not even trying to fight to prevent any of their assets being seized because they didn't show up in court for any of the hearings. That's why he's able to petition for a summary judgment because they didn't show up. Yeah, and the thing is, with the Anthem deal being like it is, they don't have to. It's not their responsibility. That's what I was going to say. The thing they're, is, they're not going to go after Anthem. They're going to go after Dixie Carter's personal assets, correct? Yeah, because she's the one that's left holding the bag since... Well, that's my point, though, is her lawyer didn't show up, their lawyer didn't show up, no lawyer showed up, nobody. This is a woman who didn't even provide a change of address form, <laughs> which is why she's getting sued by half the people to begin with, because they couldn't find her. <laughs> How hard is it to find her? Just go yeah, to Nashville and look for the dumbest bitch on Broadway, that's her. And Amex lost you still floating out there, too, so... Yeah, the Amex is. There's a couple of other from a couple of other production companies and merchandise providers and the Bischoff one. And I think that's, I think there's like five out there total. And I think Corgan's is finally gone. All three of Corgan's suits? Didn't he lend her money like three different times? Weren't there three separate issues with that? I think Anthem settled with Corgan so he'd go away. Yeah. Okay, so Anthem, Anthem paid Corgan back for every loan that he made to Dixie Carter. Or some sort of structured deal. I don't think he got all the money at once, but he got an agreement for them to repay him back in terms that were favorable to him that he accepted. And, and uh-huh. unlike Dixie, they'll probably honor that agreement to pay him back. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I don't think they wanted to bother with him. But, yeah, this stupid little going back and doing a copy and paste out a word to put a little trademark thing beside everything, that's, that's just not going to fly. Well, and as we mentioned, trademarks have also been an issue with AAA because they keep trying to trademark every derivative of every wrestler who's ever left their promotion. And how long and can it's they not, keep... It's not really every derivative. It's every derivative that the talent comes up with, which is being petty and vindictive. Right. And how It's like long... they wait until the wrestler changes his name, and then they file a trademark for that name that they didn't come up with. Which I'm wondering how long that flies in any court of law. I don't care whether it's Mexico, the United States, or anywhere else. I can't see how that's going to hold up when you keep trademarking everything somebody else comes up with. Well, I mean, what else are they going to do? Well, I guess they can just add being morally bankrupt to financially bankrupt. That's what they can do. They can can move on. They can accept the fact that their talent has left and move on and go forward. They're not going to do that, though. It's like, I think AAA is pretty much at the point where they're doing whatever they can do to stay relevant. They're in survival mode. That's what they are. (laughs) They're desperate. Well, I think they, yeah, I think they truly believe that even bad press is good press. You know, any publicity is good publicity. And it's not. Well, I think. And this whole working relationship between AAA and Impact and Crash is going to be so much fun because Crash and AAA hate each other. Yeah, Yeah, Conan has very publicly gone on the record and say, I will not work with any of those fuckers, quote, unquote. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting to see just what the hell Jeff Jarrett is thinking about, thinking with all of this. Oh, and speaking of Jeff Jarrett and Impact, the ITV World of Sport deal is official. They are going forward with the relaunch, and he's on his way over there to try to get Impact Wrestling in bed with ITV. I thought that they had decided to go with Impact instead of going with World of Sport. No, now they're going with World of Sport, and he's trained to be a part of it. Well, last week it was they decided to go with established programming instead of bringing something back. <laughs> yeah, well, the, uh, as recently and, uh, as tonight. Yeah. I mean, this just came out. I my can't latest... keep up with this crap. <laughs> Why don't I just read you my news update about it? Because that'll explain it as best I can. Or better I've than avoided the news today because I've been in a really bad mood about some stuff. And, you know, it was like, I'm just, I'm not even, I'm not looking at it. I'm not writing it. I'm not editing it. I just, I can't do it today after, you know, writing eight stories yesterday and dealing with crap today. It's like, I'm not doing it, so I just haven't even looked at anything. All right. Well, from Pro Wrestling Insider, ITV has officially signed off on the relaunch of World of Sport. Jeff Jarrett is on his way to London to speak with them about potentially partnering with Impact. 
No, don't do it. Don't do it. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, just don't do it. Okay. Don't don't hook your. No, you're a new boat. You're a new shiny <laughs> boat that just got relaunched from a new shiny pier. Do not hook yourself up to the to the rat infested, patched up tugboat that is Impact Wrestling. Was, because it will sink your ass before you get into deep water. I was about to say, don't be sunk by the fail boat that is impact, because you'll go down with Yeah. <laughs> just just don't do it. Just just go out on your own and succeed, and do not have that albatross around your neck. Mm, that is my word of the day, albatross, because a lot of the things that I have seen, read, dealt with today have felt like an albatross around my fucking neck. It's just... It's just if you go in World of Sport and relaunching it, relaunch it free of stupidity like TNA. Just just don't do it. Indeed. And I have to now bring up a sad note for us to discuss. The unfortunate passing of Jim Ross's wife, Jan. This was just terrible. What a shitty week it's been. I mean, she goes to the gym right near her home, on her scooter, gets hit by a 17-year-old, tossed from the scooter, traumatic brain injury due to multiple skull lacerations, and... Not wearing a helmet, so it made it even worse. Yeah. Yeah, Goes through surgery, is put on life support, and there's nothing they can do. Yeah, there was swelling of her brain that wasn't going down, and they couldn't do anything about it. Skull fracture in two places, I believe. Yeah, multiple skull fractures, so at least two. Who knows how many, but it doesn't matter. Any skull fracture is not good, and swelling on the brain definitely isn't good. And it, it was just dire from the very beginning we heard about it, and it only got worse when Jarrah said, it, you can't imagine how heartbreaking it is to see your loved one on life support clinging to life. We knew it was bad right then and there, and it didn't get any better. No. And when that came out yesterday, you know, that the priest had given her last Last rites. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't clear then if she had been taken off life support, but we knew that she was about to be. There's so many things I want to say and so many things I don't even know how to say, but I'm going to do my best to try to say this anyway. There's not a single person that I've listened to, read, or heard from that has ever had a bad word to say about Jan. Everyone describes her as a sweetheart. Everyone describes her as Jarrah's rock, that whenever things were bad for him, he could always lean on her. And she was just a jewel to the wrestling world. And for him to lose her, and for her to be lost to the wrestling community, is just doubly heartbreaking, because what will Jr. do without her, and what will the wrestling business do without Jr. if he can't go on without her? Let's hope that's not the case. I mean, he sounded very, very down, but by that same token, was tweeting stuff about his show today. Well, I think that may also I don't think be that was him, probably, but yeah, it might have been somebody, you know. Or that, or it's the survivor's mentality where you just have to bury yourself in work and mm-hmm. plow on because you don't, get on, yeah. you don't know what else not, to maybe do. Maybe not just bury yourself in work, but you know, continue with the routine you have so that you're not focusing on her death every moment that you have free time. The less free time you have, the less time there is to think about it. But yeah, just not, not wallowing it, I guess. Just you know, continuing on with what he would have done anyway, what she would have wanted him to do. And I'm sure she would have wanted him to keep on, but I just, I keep over and over hearing all the podcasts that I've listened to about her in my head and how much he loved her and how much he worshipped the ground that she walked on and how everybody that ever interacted with her had nothing but the kindest things to say about her. And it, it tears my heart apart and I didn't know her and I never met her and I feel like just because of all these other people... I, I feel connected to her in some way that I'm like, if I feel this bad, how can JR not dwell on it? How can it not tear him apart? I mean, for God's sake, yeah, because- Sean Waltman broke down and cried on his show. That's that, that everybody loves her. Sorry, there there aren't many people in this business that 
everybody can agree was a wonderful person. You know, even somebody that was on the periphery of the business like she was. But, you know, she just seemed to be one of these universally loved people that was the spouse of somebody integral to professional wrestling that everyone gravitated towards and, you know, adored and liked and respected. And, you know, now she's gone and it was a shock because she was so young and the circumstances were so just horribly tragic. And, and so random too, just the, yeah. the complete out of nowhereness of this whole thing. It's not like she'd had a cancer and had been suffering for years and it was finally time to say goodbye. It just struck out of the blue. Yeah, I mean, I was up, I think I was watching, it happened Monday night, right? Yes. Yeah, because I was watching the New Japan Cup when the tweet came across that Jim Ross put out. You know, the first initial tweet that he put out and it was like, Wait a minute, what? Huh? Yeah, it was something like... You know, saying that she had been in the accident. Right, say a prayer for my angel, she needs your support, something to that effect. Yeah, and it was like, oh my God, what's happening, what's going on? You know, and then slowly the news starts to trickle in, and it's like, it's just something completely out of the blue and horrible. And I think all of us can, all of us feel so bad for Jim Ross because he was the voice of this sport that we love he was who we heard every week week in week out week in week out so we can we feel closer to him than we do to some of the others so in conclusion all i can say is godspeed to jr this is horrible i hope he can overcome this difficult situation learn to i you'll never get over it but you can integrate grief into your life and somehow find a way to continue on and that's what he's going to have to do but for now all i can say is my best wishes to him and it's terrible and i just hope he's doing okay or the best he can yes so from that debbie downer news uh hopefully somebody's got something they can cheer me up because i can't think of another topic at the moment we are going to talk about South Paul Regional Wrestling. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, that that could brighten my mood a little bit. We could talk about South I'm Paul. scrolling through the news that has come up since we were last here last week. And South Paul Regional Wrestling was one of the things that was here <laughs> that came up on Friday. Oh, my God. I loved it. I it thought was, it was John, so John Cena's take on, on Lance Russell as Lance Catamaran is just hilarious. <laughs> I spent six glorious weeks as the lead anchor in Utica, New York. <laughs> and Chet Cheddarfield, who's sitting there drunk, Susan, please call me. You know, just dry. <laughs> just, you know. I swear, for the first three episodes, I thought Chet Cheddarfield was Cesaro. I did not realize it was Fandango until the final episode when they showed a close-up of his face. But you couldn't not know that Jericho was the backstage reporter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did a good job, but yeah, you could tell it was Jericho. And how much did Abby love it after saying all this time that TJ Perkins has no personality, that he was the regional champion from Southpaw who had no personality? John Johnston, yes. <laughs> Art imitating life. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's uh, like you dry piece of cardboard. This is perfect for you. I love the thing with the sea monster. That reminded me so much of, of that Tijo Khan promo where they had him running out of the lake and in it, Memphis back in the day. That was uh, with, with Mark Gulleen standing there in his, in his overcoat with the microphone and Tijo Khan just comes running out. I thought that was the perfect lampoon of that with the sea monster. But you can't talk about the sea monster and not talk about the feud between the baker and the farmer because <laughs> Rusev, Rusev as the farmer, by God, he steals the show. <laughs> fight for he, the chickens! He, he tries. Lord knows he tries. We fight for the chickens! We eat chickens! <laughs> yes, Big Bartholomew and Mr. McElroy. <laughs> With the mustache. And Christian Joy, who off. cannot live on the street anymore. Oh, so many feuds in this <laughs> that I want to actually see pay off in a ring. I want to see Chad Too Bad and Tex Ferguson. I want them to go <laughs> into a ring and, and hash it out. We have to wait for the Equality beer. 
in between him sending Bad News Allen and Freddie Blassie <laughs> to downtown his eyes and, and, and Greg Valentine to, you know, put him in an arm bar for four days. I don't know. He doesn't have that many limbs left to get to the ring. Oh, and, and I love him complaining over and over again. Uh, guys, I'm hearing a voice in my ear. I think we got a problem. We need to start this over. <laughs> We're alive. <He's> blind. <laughs> Bad news yeah, both of its eyes out one eye. out. Freddie Blassie chewed the other one out. This, this is how I know it was a hit on all levels, not just with us, but just anybody who watched it. Michelle came in and sat down and watched all four episodes with me and howled laughing through the whole thing. It was so good. And that mean, I mean, you know it was good also when you tune in to Raw on Monday night and you see people with signs saying, I would rather be at Lethal Leap Year. <laughs> and sadly, WWE has no plans to continue this as of right now. I know. Although Hopefully the, they've changed that since Cena was on Fallon last night giving out t-shirts. Right, and he did so send May? out a tweet saying, tweet all of these people if you want more episodes. Yes, we definitely want more episodes. Rather see that than Total Bellas. Well, unless it's the Mrs. version of Total Bellas, which was awesome. I have to say. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that version of Toto Bellas, I would totally... It's like, Maurice is a better Bella than the actual Bellas. <laughs> Tyler Breeze is a better Bella than Nikki Bella, so... <laughs> that was funny, too. <laughs> oh, especially the talking smack part, or, or was it an extra, I forget which, where he walks up and walks away with her instead of Nikki, and Nikki just stands there like, what the fuck? Yeah, that was one of the extras that they did, I think, after Talking Smack. Right. But I, that cracked me up, too. He's like, come on, Nikki, we're out of here. And then she's just standing there like, what? <laughs> and it's bad when at WrestleMania, one of the matches you're looking forward to is this stupid pile of shit. Yeah. You know, Miz and Maurice versus Cena and Nikki. At the... I can't say I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I actually can, just because the Miz has done a good enough job building up the match. Mm-hmm. Lord. It's like I'm looking up and down the WrestleMania card, and I wish I could say there was a match I was looking forward to. But I'm looking forward to Jericho and Owens as well. That should be a good match. That should be fun. That might be good. Uh -huh. Maybe they'll add a pre-show match with some cruiserweight guys that I'll be looking forward to. But Well, we know that we're going to get Neville and... Austin Aries. Aries, yeah. The yeah, only thing that popped I mean, into my head was Banana Man. But yeah, they, they clusterfucked both women's titles. They have to make that, you know, put as many women in the ring at once as we can. Oh, the SmackDown one is an even bigger clusterfuck than you know, because there is about five extra women that are going to be added to it. Yay. It, yeah, Kelly, Kelly, and... Um, Lita, and Victoria, and... Uh, is Lita going to be drunk? Don't know. That could be the greatest match ever if it's Drunk Leader from the pre-show. <laughs> oh, Lord. That one I might look forward to if it's Drunk Leader. Poor Leader. Why can't they just call mm. up Ruby Riot from NXT and let her in the match? I'd rather see that. Because she would kill everybody in the ring. That's what I want. Heidi Lovelace would get in there and be like, shit, bitches, I'll take you out in five minutes. Come on, let's go. She'd take them all out. Every time I've ever seen her, whether it's a winning or a losing match, she always fucking kills it in the ring, physically or mm -hmm. literally. Let's see, what other news did we have this week? Oh, yeah, there's that uh, whole WWE wanting to buy a Ring of Honor thing. Yes. Yeah. The no. on-again, off-again rumor that has now been given some validity, but they continue to deny that it actually is happening. Both WWE and Ring of Honor are issuing denials, even though everybody else is saying, yeah, they've talked. And the wonderful thing is, and, you know, the fans, oh, this will be so great of Ring of, for Ring of Honor. You know, the guys will get on the network and, you know, it'll be a good platform for them. You idiots, don't you realize that WWE is not doing this to get talent? They're doing it to put the company out of business. They want the and library. get a tape library. Yeah, yep. this, that's what they want. This is WCW all over again. They want to buy the competition so they can kill it. Yeah, and keep it. You know, and all of this stuff. There's a small little group of people talking last night, and it's like, okay, they're going to do it for the library, which is understandable. A lot of the top stars in WWE now 
got their names in Ring of Honor, even though they had to change their names when they came to WWE. Yeah, Tyler Everybody Black, knows a.k.a. Them Seth from, Rollins, and Brian Danielson, a.k.a. Daniel Bryan, Kevin Steen, a.k.a. Kevin Owens, and so on. Yeah. There was that El Generico guy that some people think is Sami Zayn, but it's not. <laughs> no, he's so, oh, he's still he at the monastery in Mexico helping the orphans. Yeah, he's down there at the orphanage. So that and, you know, there's some rumor came out that somebody put a hit on him and he's dead. But I don't I'm just going to prefer to think he's still helping the orphans. But they're doing this to have one last place that people can go and wrestle. They're doing this so that they can keep contracts down, contract payouts down, because there's less competition. So there's less places for people to go and work and get a higher pay. Um and they're doing if this New because Japan Sinclair really, doesn't give a fuck about Ring of Honor and will take the money and run. Yeah. And if New Japan comes over here, well, then Ring of Honor is their quote-unquote developmental in the U.S. And it takes away, you know, that partner from New Japan. Because Kidani seems to be the only person who's not scared to take on Vince McMahon. He's got no fear when it comes to Vince. He's like, bring it. So a friend of mine asked me last night, who does New Japan partner with if Ring of Honor goes out of business? And then he immediately suggested Pro Wrestling Gorilla. That and, was my, yeah, that would be my PWG. Yeah, PWG. The only thing is, I wonder if that would even be big enough for New Japan because they don't have television. Do they need Doesn't to? not matter. I mean, They've got a rabid fan base on the West Coast. They do, but... Do, they do, sell out tickets in 10 minutes. I, I know, I've bought tickets. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, if you're going to be smart, like Kadani seems to be, and focus right now just on that area in Southern California, yes, that is your smart move right there, is to have some kind of relationship with Pro Wrestling Gorilla. Mm-hmm. I just think and this is if Ring of Honor goes away. If, yeah. It, it's all still up in the air as to not whether this will even happen. Yeah, who knows? Like you said, Sinclair could care less about Ring of Honor. They, for them, it's just a block of programming on their channels. Mm-hmm. It's not like Ted Turner, who had a great, deep, abiding fanship and love for professional wrestling and was dumber than a box of rocks when it came to it. <laughs> and and had an open checkbook and let Eric yeah. Bischoff write and, checks. You know, it's not like that. We're never going to have that again. Um it's not like Jeff Jarrett, who doesn't want to see his creation die. Ring of Honor is kind of just syndicated programming. Mm-hmm. And they're really, really vulnerable to something like this happening. So we'll see what the future holds for Ring of Honor. But for now, it's a lot of speculation and no actual deal on the table. Correct. So does and, that- of course, that one of the things, if it is true, the one thing I have to wonder, and I wrote this when I wrote my piece up last night, you would think that New Japan would be smart enough to have a contract in place with Ring of Honor and Sinclair. Talent, you know, talent swap contracts, working relationship contracts, whatever. I wonder if this could be one of those things, if that's the case, contract tampering on WWE's part. That would be why they would be keeping it quiet if they were negotiating. I mean, that would give New Japan and Bushi Road a lot of ammunition to come after WWE. Sure would. I don't know. I just, I don't want a world where everything is co-opted by WWE. That would be horrible. You know, I don't want all of wrestling to fall under, under one umbrella. It It's never good. Well, this did raise another question, aside from WWE trying to become the mega conglomerate. It also raises the question of, what does this mean if you're one of those British indie promotions they've been courting to suddenly learn that they're also courting buying out Ring of Honor? Does that put you in a position where you're no longer relevant? Let's look at it. Are the British guys really relevant anyway? What have they done with them since January? These 13, 14 men that they signed to $19,000 contracts who cannot appear on television or on the air for any other promotion unless WWE okays it and unless the promotion's in bed with WWE. You know, what have they done with them? Nothing. This whole UK television deal we've heard about for the network, what what are they doing? Nothing. 
Tyler Bate, what has WWE specifically done with him? Uh, brought him in for one match on NXT. Hey. So what you're saying is they're going from nothing to nothing. It really changes nothing. It, right, because I think Vince is in this mode of, I'm not going to buy you to use you. I'm going to buy you so that I can say I have you. I'm going to buy you so no one else can use you. Exactly. He's like a collector that, you know, those old, you know, the old crazy men that have a lot of money and don't know what to do with it, that buy pretty things and put them in glass cases just so they can look at them. And so they can say nobody else has them. I think that's kind of where he is now. Yeah. I mean, they took out a $20 million loan for future business expansion in December. And it's like, oh, well, now we know why they did that. Let's just go around and buy everybody. <laughs> So Vince McMahon is the upside down bicycle airplane stamp collector of the wrestling world. Pretty much. I have no clue what that means, but it sounds about it's a right. very rare stamp. <laughs> it's the most rare stamp of all time. Yeah, he's that guy. Or the guy yeah. Yeah, he's that guy. Let let's go buy all the good stuff just so that these other people can't have it. <laughs> I'm not gonna use you you know, I'm not gonna use this really, really great, wonderful set of China but I'm going to have it just so that this other guy over here can't use it. Abby, I want to tie this together for you. Have you ever seen the movie Brewster's Millions? A long time ago, and probably I do not remember 99.9% of it. I do because it's one of my all-time favorite comedies. It's Richard Pryor and John Candy, and the premise is that Richard Pryor's character has to spend $30 million in 30 days or else he doesn't get a $300 million inheritance. And one of the ways they saddle him with not being able to spend it is he can't have any assets at the end of the 30 days. Like, he can't just buy a bunch of art and put it in glass cases and admire it because then those assets will be counted against him. The way he gets around this is he buys the rare stamp I'm talking about and then mails it to somebody on a postcard. He uses it as postage. Oh. <laughs> he takes a $2 million Alrighty stamp then. and he puts it in the mail to somebody. It's great. No, he doesn't just put it in the mail. He licks it and puts it on the envelope as postage. <laughs> I know. It's one of the funniest scenes in the whole fucking movie is he purposefully ruins a $2 million stamp. As you can People see, with money are just weird. It's, it's the best when the evil lawyers that are trying to scheme about if it's inherited see the postcard and they freak out. He mailed it! He mailed it! It's a great movie. Any of you listening that have never seen Brewster's Millions, go out and read it. Now I'm going to have to go back and watch it. It is a fucking hilarious movie. It's one of the best ever. Rotten Tomatoes may not say so, but I do, damn it. I, will I don't to listen to Rotten too. Tomatoes. It, it, is, it is a funny movie. It's not... You know, it's not a brilliant intellectual comedy, but it's a fun, just sit back and laugh your ass off comedy. It's Richard Pryor. It's funny yeah, Richard there's Pryor. There's not much bad about him. And speaking of ways you can tie it back into wrestling, the scene where they're jumping up and down and getting all excited because they made money in the stock market, I can picture Vince McMahon in his office anytime the price goes up doing the $10 million, $10 million, $10 million, $10 million, $10 million, $10 million. $10 million. <laughs> Lord. So I'll be interested to see, like after the month after WrestleMania, what is that? March in March, how the WWE Network's numbers will do? Oh, they've already scheduled a conference call for the day after WrestleMania. It's like I'm going to see see how many people cancel their subscriptions. You know, how many people are going to sign up for that free month in April and then drop it the next month? That's what I'd like to see. Oh, they lost hundreds of thousands last year. It was immediate. They did, and I'm wondering, you know, how much of that ill will is going to continue over this year with as bad as WrestleMania was last year. If it's kind of on par with that this year, are they looking for a repeat? Is it going to be a bigger drop-off? Is it going to be the same? I guess time will tell with that. I don't even think it's Roman Reigns. It's not ill will. It's just freeloading. It's get WrestleMania for free and they're not up to pay. But go ahead, Abby. I mean, you're going to have Roman Reigns beating The Undertaker clean, which (laughs) people aren't going to like. You're going to have a three-minute match between Bill Goldberg and Brock Lesnar, which people don't want to see. So, yeah, there, there's going to be some ill will, but mostly it's going to be the freeloaders dropping it because they didn't want to pay 100 bucks for WrestleMania. And it's going to be, you know, that small group of casual fans or diehard fans that say, I ain't doing this shit no more. It's just not worth it. 
And that leaves the rest of us holding the bag who routinely pay nine ninety nine a month for it and never cancel and never get it free. We're the ones subsidizing everybody else. Yeah. I mean, I've had it since the day it came out. I've yet to get a free month. Yeah. I, it makes me want to cancel so I can get WrestleMania for free because I know that's what they do. They, out, they email the incentive to anybody who cancels. Yep. But we're just too loyal or too stupid and we keep paying for it every month like clockwork. Uh-huh. But at least you can watch South Park Regional Wrestling on it. Yeah. No, you can't. You can watch that on YouTube. I thought they, <laughs> I thought they it put YouTube. it on the network, too. I thought it was on both. No, it's on WWE.com and on the YouTube channel. Well, they add stuff on YouTube to the network eventually anyway, so if it's not there now, it will be. Speaking of South Paul Regional Wrestling, uh, the WWE Hall of Fame is going to feature Jim Cornette this year. That'll yeah. be interesting. I believe he if said hell has makes officially it out of frozen over. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, if if he makes it out of Orlando alive, I'm going to be shocked. <laughs> With all the shit he's talked about WWE and some of the wrestlers there, I will be. I'm kind, part of me is hoping that Kevin Owens rushes, rushes the stage and kills him. Well, I live believe, during the ceremony. I believe he said something to the effect of, if he thinks it's fun to put the Rock and Roll Express over, imagine what he has to do it for me. Yeah, wait till he has to induct me. Uh huh. <laughs> I just find it kind of surprising that you know. I mean, Cornette's the perfect choice to, and I can't think of anybody else to induct the Rock and Roll Express because Cornette is the obvious choice. But yeah, it, it, it's kind of like hell freezing over to have him back on WWE television in any capacity. He knows the history more than anybody else does, so like you said, there's nobody more qualified. He is eminently qualified to be the one to do it, even for a stupid, fictitious Hall of Fame that's chosen by Vince McMahon and not by any voters. He is still the most eminently qualified. Yep, 35 years of history, and it's like, damn, it really has been that long. Because <laughs> I remember watching them when I first, you know, I was in second grade when I started watching wrestling. Yeah, because I'd had my tonsils out and was, you know, at home over Christmas and flipping through the channels and found it one day. And it was Dusty Rhodes, Tully Blanchard, and Baby Doll. And I'm pretty much sure that the Rock and Roll Express was on there somewhere. They would almost have to be. I believe Cornette said on his most recent show that during the heyday, during the time period you're talking about, he would walk into people's homes and see two pictures on the wall. Jesus and the Rock and Roll Express. In the South, that doesn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. In the South, they were equal. They were on the same footing. Them? Oh, God. Who's the guy? What? Oh. Tommy Rich. Oh, Wildfire Tommy Rich. Wildfire. Yep. <laughs> Lord. Now, I know you have your mixed opinions on Dave Meltzer, Abby. You've made that abundantly clear on the show before. <sighs> But I, I want to give you this chance to either agree or disagree with something he said. When this, I disagree. And let me finish and maybe you won't. It doesn't matter. <laughs> because I'm going to be a contrarian and disagree on principle. Because okay. somebody said in a question to the Wrestling Observer mailbag, does so-and-so deserve to be in the Hall of Fame? And Dave's response was, what does it matter? It's the WWE Hall of Fame. Everybody deserves to be in it. It's Vince McMahon's whims. That's it's not a matter of do they deserve to be in it or not. It's whether it's it's whoever Vince McMahon wants in it. It's not a real Hall of Fame. That's exactly his point. It's everybody deserves to be in it because nothing is, it doesn't matter. It's his whim. Pete Rose is in it. Drew Carey is in it. I love Coco, Coco Beware, Beware he is does, in it. He's not a you Hall know. of Famer. He's in it because he was put in it. He's not, he's, he, I, when I was a kid, I loved Koga Beware, but that doesn't mean he's a Hall of Famer. The Godfather is in it. You know, it's not like the Pro Wrestling well, at Hall least of Fame. The Godfather actually won a couple of titles. He didn't win Brawl. Well, I mean, you have to remember the Godfather was also Papa Shango and a couple <laughs> of other people. And yeah, yeah, you know, I'm it's a like human fighting machine. Yes, not it's not a real Hall of Fame. It's no. it's whoever Vince McMahon thinks is going to draw viewers in that year. Was he Quang the not, Ninja too? No, I don't think so. Or that was Savio Vega. That's yeah. that's who Quang the Ninja was. Yeah. So yeah, it's just kind of whoever's there. 
All right. Well, to me, right. Cauliflower Alley and the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame are much more legitimate and the Observer sources Hall of for because they actually pull people in the industry. Yeah, but that's another thing where Meltzer decides who is on the ballot. He doesn't decide who wins, but he decides who's on the ballot. So well, it's the voters also decide that because if enough of a percentage of them don't vote for it, they drop off the ballot. Yeah, but still, I mean, it's one of those things where it's it's a person's opinion. Well, in this day whereas and age, these other places, it's kind of like you look at. It's just, it's all too fucking subjective. I mean, I was, that's what I I was about to say. Everything is a person's opinion when you get right down to it. Yeah. I don't know. What other little news blurbs do we have this week? Oh, the folks from Progress being on, um, being at Access this year. That's right. Yeah. And I'm just going to say this because I've had some arguments with people on Twitter this week about it. This is not a great thing. This is not a bad thing. This is just a thing. You know, these guys, these men and women from Progress, like Mark Haskins and Dahlia Black and Jimmy Havoc, that we have fallen in love with in Progress, it's not going to be the versions of these people that are seen at Access. You're not going to see Jimmy Havoc coming out in, in the Hannibal mask to AFI's I Hope You Suffer, flipping everybody off drinking a beer from somebody in the crowd and hitting somebody, you know, with a chair at Access. We're going to get, you know, Havoc Ultralight, who is approved and micromanaged by McMahon's little band of merry men. We're going to get the Mickey Mouse version of Jimmy Havoc and the Mickey Mouse version of Mark Haskins. We're not going to get the progress version of these people or the ICW version of these people. So, no, this is not a stage for them to perform on where they're going to get to shine and show you know why they have been so great everywhere no their bodies to fill time asses to put in seats literally yeah and if you know if it ends up that some of them get signed by wwe great if that's what they want i don't give two shits about progress being in bed with wwe i don't give two shits about wwe period I care about these men and women who busted their asses on the indies and everybody thinking, oh, this is great and wonderful because WWE's noticed them. God, people read your history books. WWE does not notice people and start working with them to build them up. They start noticing them and working with them to put them down and take them over. No further history needs to be seen than what happened to AWA in the 1980s for proof of that. Mm Mm-hmm. We'll take your stock top stars. Uh, we won't use them properly. We'll cut the rug out from under you, and we'll put you out of business. Read your history. <laughs> if these men and women want to come in, and they want to sign with WWE for whatever they do and whatever they think they're going to get, they're adults. Let them do it. That's fine. But don't think that just because WWE is bringing them in access that this is a great and wonderful thing, because it's not. Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. So, um, that cheerful note, maybe it's time to wrap up and get some plugs. What do you say, Abby? Works for me. So, Top Rope Press, what else? Um, um, <laughs> my brain just went blank. <laughs> um, you can find me on Twitter at Abby A. Um, I will plug New Japan World, the best 999 yen you can spend every month, which is, I think, roughly down to, like, 814 or something this month. Yeah, it's pretty cheap right now. Um, DDT Universe, which <laughs> DDT had their anniversary show on Sunday. I'm just going to say Muda, Abushi across the ring from each other, dressed as samurais, wrestling in a match. Go and get DDT Universe. I it's have- 900 yen a month. It's so much fun. I have one other thing to say about DDT Universe before you plug away, and that's anal explosion match. Oh, yeah, and Donald Trump owns it now. So there you go. There, there's all these reasons to just go get it. Yes. <laughs> right on. All right, if that's all your plugs. Yes, that is my plugs for this week. All right, then it's Jason's turn. What do you have to plug? 
Oh, I'm going to plug the Media Center software, Cody, K-O-D-I dot TV. Check that out. And if you want to find out how deep the rabbit hole with Cody really goes, you got to start by going down the rabbit hole first. To go down the rabbit hole, to start your journey, go to tvaddons.ag. I'm also going to plug the site, whosampled.com. If you want to find out what song was sampled where or what song sampled another song, check out whosampled.com. I've been using that a lot this week. Uh, check me out on Twitter. I'm at Great Sudoku, and check out AngryMarks.com. Yes, I actually want to plug Who Sampled as well because anytime I hear a song and I'm writing an album review and I think I know that break, I know it was used in something else, but I don't want to be wrong if I say it. I'll go to Who Sampled and look it up, and God damn it, every time I think I'm right, I am because I'll look it up and it'll be like, shit, I knew that Harold Melvin and the Blue Note song was sampled by somebody else. I was right, God damn it. Great site, yeah. It's just just a great, wonderful resource for finding out who sampled who, and and yeah, you can you can look it up both ways. You can look up a song where you're like, I'm not sure where that sample is from, or if you're like, you know, I've heard the '70s song, and I'm sure it was sampled in something. You can look it up that way too. And it even lists interpolations. It won't just list straight up jacks. It'll list where people remade the original sample and tried to be more clever, but it's still identifiable as the original. Yes, it's not just straight up. But yeah, they'll talk about, you know, did they use a hook? Did they use the drums? Did they use lyrics? Did they use vocals? They'll use, they'll, they'll cite it down to that, that degree of articulation. And it's just, it's a wonderful resource. So definitely check out whosample.com. Yes, he's absolutely right. They even timestamp it. They'll say sample starts at 013 and 206. They'll tell you and what parts of the song to listen to to know where the sample comes from. And a lot of them will have links to YouTube videos where you can hit the jump button, and it will jump right to that point where each sample is. The original, you can jump to the original part that was sampled, and you can go to the sample track and hit the jump button. It'll take you to the part, and you can hear it, and it's like, God damn, they did lift that from that track. Look at that. You know what one of the funniest things I ever discovered from who sampled was? What's that? That the actor who plays the doctor on NCIS, the one who does all the autopsies, did the break that Dr. Dre samples in the next episode. <laughs> Ducky is hip-hop. 